going, Kevin? Sure, I will try. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Melody Moore at San Diego Opera, and I'm the Artistic Administrator. And as you can tell, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Kevin is not actually able to log on for some reason. So we're beginning by um, my, I'm going to introduce uh, both these fine panelists, and they're going to um, tell you a little bit more about themselves while I mute and try to help him. Um, so thank you for joining us today. A little bit of housekeeping, Kevin, I'm gonna um, talk to you in just a minute, okay? A uh, little bit of housekeeping here. Hi. You are? Great, thank you. We'll see you in a minute. Okay, all right, he's coming. So uh, the housekeeping is that the Q&A down at the bottom um, next to chat, that is absolutely for well-formulated full sentence questions that might uh, be answerable by just reading them. Um, any other kind of commentary will be in the chat. I will be monitoring both. Hey, Kevin, it's good to see you. I'm so glad you're on. Uh, and we will start the Q&A after it feels that uh, Margaret and Julia have wrapped up what they uh, are presenting. The very first question, as always, will come from Kevin. And then I will open the chat, the room and tell you that it's time to begin your questions. We will go to 5.30 unless the questions have dwindled down and we're all ready to uh, go cook our dinner. And that could be the case, so don't feel badly. Um, today we have with us Kevin Suzuki. Kevin, please introduce yourself sure. as our moderator and then our guest. Thank you so much. Wonderful. I apologize. I had some technical issues on my end and now they've been solved, so I'm here. Um, hello and welcome to week four of San Diego, San Diego Opera's panels discussing uh, Madame Butterfly and some of the cultural issues surrounding uh, his, Puccini's work. Um, my name is Kevin Suzuki. I am a dancer choreographer and I'm also the director of the Japanese Folk Dance Institute of New York. Um, we preserve and perform traditions that go back a thousand years. And one of the reasons I am here is that in addition to all my work with dance, I also act as a cultural and movement advisor to productions of Mud and Madden Butterfly. I've worked with uh, Portland Opera, Dallas Opera, uh, Atlanta Opera, among others in that capacity. Um, and also I'm also half Japanese. And so because of who I am and also uh, what I do, I'm sort of very concerned about these issues and um, passionate about them. So that's why I'm here. And so today's topic is American colonialism, expansion and American exceptionalism. So uh, today's panelists are Margaret Ozaki Graves and Julia Shizio Popham. Uh, Margaret Ozaki Graves is the Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement at Central City Opera, producing education, performance works, and curating events in service to the community with a focus upon operatic works. Uh, she holds degrees from Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, Lawrence University, and a Certificate in Diversity and Inclusion from Cornell University. Uh, she was trained in traditional Japanese music from childhood. Um, and her recent creative, creative work was supported by a 2022 Address Anti-Asian Racism grant sponsored by CU Boulder, Kaiser Permanente, and Asian Americans Advancing Justice. She has taught at Ithaca College, uh, University, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and, and is a distinguished faculty slash regional director at Sarah Schools Music. Uh, she is a soprano and has sung across the U.S. and Germany and all over her home state of Colorado. Uh, recent performances include new works by Nathan Hall and Ruben Pirainen. Uh, she is also involved in multiple Japanese arts network projects, including the children's symphony story, Tamiko and the Magic Violin, and has been featured in a recent news documentary on Japanese American incarceration, uh, Injustice Forever, the story of Machi. Okay. And our second panelist is Julia Shizio Popham. Um, she is a mixed race Asian American woman with roots in the coal mines of Rock Springs in Hannah, Wyoming. Uh, she is also a doctoral student in critical ethnic studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she works in the fields of Asian American studies and visual culture. Julia's research focuses on how art from the Amachi Japanese American incarceration camp sheds light on how incarcerated artists navigate the question of what it means to be a human uh, while existing within the dehumanizing context of confinement. Uh, Julie earned a BS in violin performance from Northwestern University and has toured on violin with Carnegie Hall's first 
uh, U.S. National Youth Orchestra, where she performed in venues such as the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., the Great Hall in Moscow, and the Royal Albert Hall for the BBC Proms in London. Um, she has a very robust background in uh, instrumental classical music and Asian American studies, which enables her to approach the issue of Orientalism in opera as both a lover of classical music and scholar committed to social justice. And also as a reminder, um, as they are giving their presentation, please start thinking of questions. If you have any questions for what uh, any parts of the presentation, please start using the Q&A prompt. If you want to write it down on a notepad, if you want to just put it in the Q&A, either one is fine. Um, I'm somebody who, as soon as I have a thought, it escapes and flies away. So uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, please write it down because we love to have a robust, robust discussion once the presentation is over. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to our lovely panelists. Did you unmute Margaret? There, there. we go. <laughs> First day on Zoom. Um, thank you uh, to San Diego Opera, everyone who's attending, Melody, uh, Kevin, and especially Julia, who's joining me here today. Um, I'm Margaret Ozaki Graves. You can call me Meg. Um, I wanted to give you a little thumbnail. Uh, Kevin gave us our gave our fancy bios, but basically what's important for you to know about me is that I'm a big opera nerd and I also love traditional Japanese music and culture. Um, I am a mixed race Japanese American. Uh, I am female identifying and my lived experience as, uh, as that body in the field of opera has informed my opinions on this work and on working in the field, both as a performer and as an educator and administrator. So why I'm here today is because I have frequently been asked about Madama Butterfly being a Japanese American identifying female. Um, and I have spoken on it quite a bit. I've served as a cultural consultant to productions in the past, and I've performed the work um, many times. Uh, so I feel that I have uh, a unique position and a responsibility to provide a bridge between the art form that I love, which is opera, and the communities that I serve, as well as the community that I identify with. I'd like to introduce Julia so she can talk a little bit about herself and why she is here, and then I will connect the dots as to why the two of us are speaking to you together today. Great. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, Melody and Kevin, for having Meg and I to present today. Um, yeah, as Kevin said, my name is Julia, and I'm a doctorate student in ethnic studies at CU Boulder where I work in primarily visual arts and um, Asian American studies. But before that, my life was, um, I would say, animated by classical music and, and violin. So the reason I'm here today is, is ultimately out of my love for classical music. Um, I, as many of you know, recognize that classical music across the board is in a bit of a crisis of whether it can survive. And so that's that's part of why I'm here. But I, I do want to be forthcoming from, from the get-go and just say that my stance in terms of opera companies continuing to perform uh, Madama Butterfly and Turandot, among others, frankly, um, is that I, I think it's wrong. So as, as a mixed race Asian American woman, um, I would say being here today, <laughs> I do hold some ambivalence because on one hand, I think that this presentation and this series is an amazing educational opportunity for people of Asian descent um, to, to share our insights, our experience, our knowledge. Uh, but on the other hand, given the fact that San Diego Opera, among other opera companies, continues to perform Madama Butterfly and Turandot, 
I also can see this as being a bit performative in my own place here as being a little bit complicit. So ultimately, I, I decided that the educational part of this was worth it to me. And again, my love for classical music. Um, but I, I do just want to, again, be clear that I would like opera companies to just stop performing these operas. All right, Meg. So uh, how did Julia and I come to uh, meet? This is, uh, I think, a silver lining of what was kind of a challenging uh, panel experience and production for me. Uh, last year, uh, Opera Colorado had their 40th anniversary, and the capstone of their season was a production of Turandot. Uh, in preparation for that, in February, I sat on a community panel um, called The Riddle of Turandot. It was co-hosted by Rocky Mountain PBS and Opera Colorado. Uh, it featured some of the artistic staff um, of the company and the production, um, as well as some community members uh, in Denver, which is where the production was based. I would like to share a bit of this panel presentation. This is a community response from Chinese American Denverite, Mary Lee Chin. Humility. You know, nobody wants to say that we're racist, but there is always some unknown bias that we all have. And unless we recognize it, it's really difficult to understand uh, where the, a different culture is coming from, particularly the minority cultures. The other thing that you asked was, what is the impact on the community? And it is the perpetrating stereotypes of the dragon lady. I believe there are also characters, like one is named Pong, and what is what are the other two? Pang and Pong. That is so reminiscent of the taunting that I received. And so when you have things like that, it really is a negative impact on the community. Thank you. So I was really moved by um, Mary Lee's uh, bravery and also by what she had to say. Um, the production, was produced in May of last year. And as I sat on, had sat on the panel, I received a, a letter of response from Julia on this production of, of Turandot. Uh, she sent this to all of the members of the panel and I think some of the, the staff of Opera Colorado as well. I was really moved by her letter um, and it, it made me think a lot about this topic of community impact. And I uh, would like to give Julia the platform to share her letter now. Thanks, Meg. The other thing that and actually for this part, if you wouldn't mind just going out of screen share, yeah. Letters aren't, <laughs> at least typed letters aren't really visually pleasing. So, all right, well, thank you. So I, I'm gonna share pretty much the entirety of, of the letter that I wrote to Opera Colorado, specifically about its performance of Turandot. Um, and, I hope that this can be uh, a entry point for conversation. So, so I wrote this on the 15th of May of last year. Dear Opera Colorado, my name is Julia Shizio Popham and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Critical Ethnic Studies at CU Boulder. I write to you as someone who would like to partner with your organization regarding anti-racist and transformative justice work as a violinist, I care about the continuation of classical music and opera, yet I am deeply concerned that Opera Colorado's decision to perform Turandot, a fundamentally racist opera, 
alienates BIPOC and progressive white audiences. It's clear that Opera Colorado attempted to make a meaningful intervention given Turandot's racist content. Singers did not wear oriental masks, unlike many other national performances, and the company selected costumes that supposedly resembled a fantasy world as informed by the Santa Fe Opera's production. I also watched Rocky Mountain PBS Community Talk from February 2023, which Meg was part of, where local Asian American community leaders addressed themes of yellow face and Orientalism with director Arya Umazawa and Ellie Calkins, general and artistic director Greg Carpenter. From viewing this conversation, however, I was confused by how certain panel members interpreted Turandot's racism as an exclusively contemporary issue. For example, one white participant asked, how do we make these Orientalist operas work in this incredible world we live in where we can have conversations like these? He seemed to understand Orientalism as an antiquated problem made visible by contemporary privilege. As a fourth generation Japanese American woman, I have to ask, who does he mean by we? Who exactly does this panel member's question address? We must solely include white audiences, for let me assure you, my Japanese American great grandparents would have felt just as degraded by this opera in 1926 as my Japanese American mother and I did in 2023. Turandot's racism only appears contemporary to those who have had the privilege of being able to guiltlessly enjoy Orientalist tropes in the past. In fact, I observed that presenting Turandot's racism as a current day issue risks creating a nostalgia for a time in which white audiences could innocently consume yellow face. Put another way, this contemporary framing makes it look like racism in the past was okay. Last Saturday, my mom and I attended the opening night of Turandot where Despite Opera Colorado's community conversation, pre-performance disclaimer, and fantasy costumes, we sat in horror as characters Ping, Pang, and Pong danced around the stage in neon cackling. We had never seen Turandot before, and we wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt, even after having read about its Orientalist history. But it was worse than anything we could have imagined. For instance, the character Turandot is a celestial dragon lady of the East, who embodies the kinds of stereotypes my mom and I try to pretend don't exist. I'm not sure then if we are more upset by the opera's display of yellow face or by the primarily white audience's response. When the cast came out to bow, my mom and I looked to each other in distress while the house exploded with praise. We left Ellie Hawkins stunned. After the show, my mom and I sat outside near our cars, wondering aloud, how much mo money went into producing Turandot at the Ellie Calkins Opera House, one of the largest and most prestigious stages in Denver? How much money did it make? We both agreed that continuing to perform Turandot exceeds mere free expression, particularly when we considered how embedded people's livelihoods are in such powerful cultural institutions. It's one thing for an individual to go out and paint a racist piece of art. It's another for a well-respected cultural institution backed by news agencies, radio stations, patrons, ticket vendors, and more to put on an operatic blockbuster upholding minstrelsy. These systemic issues call me to ask why is it apparently okay to perform yellow face in Denver and across the United States? That night when I returned home, I couldn't stop crying. I sat in my kitchen rocking while the sound of the audience cheering for Turandot repeated over and over again, followed by the questions, to what extent do non-Asian Americans see me as they do Turandot? And to what extent does an opera like this shape how people fetishize women of Asian descent? Perhaps these questions are unanswerable, but regardless, Opera Colorado's performance of Turandot planted a kind of double consciousness in me, indicative of what other BIPOC communities experience in the face of racist tropes like mammies, criminals, primitives, and terrorists. I felt othered from myself. 
Although I sympathize with Opera Colorado's commitment to musical heritage and aesthetic value, I believe that continuing to perform Turandot as a canonical masterpiece is wrong. Culture has never been innocent. As storytellers, we know that cultural productions integrally shape how audiences engage the world. So if you think that Turandot deepens your audience's capacity for empathy, I must assume that you're not really considering audiences of Asian descent, because operas like Turandot stereotype us in ways that make our lives disposable. I recognize that the line separating acceptable from unacceptable is thin and always shifting, but I would not have reached out to you unless I firmly believed that perfor performing Turandot is way past that line. So that's what I wrote in May, and I, I, stick to, I stick to what I said a year ago. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much, Julia, for sharing your letter, for writing your letter. I know that both took a great deal of courage, and I truly appreciate that. Okay, now back to screen oh, sharing. I didn't know if you knew you were muted. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So now on to our topic for the day. Thanks for humoring me there. I just had to put in um, what I think could be a great little uh, um, jingle for American exceptionalism from the first act uh, duet of Pinkerton and Sharpless from Madama Butterfly. So America, colonialism, expansionism, and American exceptionalism. I'm going to start with a whole bunch of uh, definitions. So Starting with colonialism, from the Ox Oxford Dictionary, colonialism is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically. Some players in colonialism, the colonizer, uh, the next couple of definitions are taken from Jewel and Durant's This Book is Anti-Racist. Uh, I think this is a great resource for young adults and also very digestible for, for readers of any age. The, co the colonizer is described as a person who uses their power to dominate another group of people they deem inferior. Through colonization, which is when a group takes control over another, the colonizer uses violence and manipulation to gain and maintain power and control over land and resources. Colonization is when a group with power and resources dominates another group, often by violence and manipulation. The land they control uh, give the colonizer even more power in the world, and the people in colonized places become subjects under the rule of the dominant country. Colonizers may impose religion, language, economics, cultural practices, and otherwise in the process of colonization and appropriate the native or foreign culture and people. Cultural appropriation is an adoption of certain ideas about foreign culture with a limited understanding, sensitivity, and authentic resources available to those appropriating, um, sometimes combined with profiting off of the image of the foreign culture while excluding authentic representation, leading to a final effect of foreignness. Moving on to expansionism, uh, starting with the word expansion, 
the action of becoming larger or more extensive, if we're thinking about expansionism, this is the policy of territorial or economic expansion. In the case of America, I wanted to look at three um, views here of expansionism, starting with the Western expansion, um, America being colonized from East to West Coast, uh, which included periods of annexation of the American West, Southwest, uh, the tribal lands, of many different indigenous peoples, uh, as well as indigenous uh, people now inhabiting Mexico, um, as and then the Western expansion into the Pacific, which included annexation of the Hawaiian Islands and the Philippines. Uh, maritime expansion, the development and rise of commerce and trading in the West Indies and to Asia by boat. And the building and strengthening of the American Navy was happening in the, the 1900s concurrently with the opening of Japan. In 1854, there was a treaty between the United States and Japan that opened doors to trade between the two countries. This was um, after a long period of uh, no or very limited trade between um, the ports of Japan and uh, Western European countries. So Commodore Matthew Perry, you'll see this uh, woodblock print here that shows the black ships, um, as well as Commodore Perry on the banks of the port. Um, he initiated this treaty uh, between the United States and Japan to begin trade relationships, which then led to um, opening of the two countries and cultures to each other. Now, American expansionism. Uh, I, although I, I tried not to, so right now, um, I, I'm working at Central City Opera and we're preparing our summer season, which includes another great Puccini opera, uh, La Fanchula del West or The Girl of the Golden West. So I have um, Western expansion and manifest destiny on my mind. As part of that, I do think that it figures in here to Madama Butterfly as well, because I think manifest destiny uh, and that ideology really figures into this concept of American expansionism. Manifest Destiny was the Western expansion and settlement of North America and the United States. Uh, the term was coined by John Lewis O'Sullivan, uh, and he said the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which providence has given to us um, is was kind of this concept of, um, of what America is and who Americans are. I, I love this artwork, American Progress, because uh, I think it's a really good visual picture of O'Sullivan's idea of manifest destiny with this kind of heavenly figure heading to the left coast, going west. Um, and we see a lot of the activities of settlement and of violence, um, of commerce and industry and development of the lands as people are moving west or being forced out of their their homelands. So thinking about the definition of the term American exceptionalism, exceptional means something that is much greater than usual, especially in skill, intelligence, or quality. And I'm finally posing my own definition here for American exceptionalism. I invite you all to 
drop your own definitions into the chat or think about this um, as you're developing questions for Q&A. I know that this is a pretty hot button phrase in media in recent months and years. You know, what is American exceptionalism and how is it at play in our culture today? Um, I think that it's something that has been at play since at least the time of Manifest Destiny and likely before that, perhaps even from the time that um, we became America. So uh, American exceptionalism, I believe, is defined by a system that includes the following beliefs. A belief that America and Americans are unique a belief that America's history, government, economy, religion, ideology, and culture is greater or better than that of other nations, making it a morally superior country, the greatest, the best. And a belief that Americans have a special purpose and responsibility to expand and extend the American way of life, which could include government, economy, religion, ideology, and culture, amongst other things. Okay, so you are probably wondering, um, how does this figure into Madama Butterfly? And I know that you, this is week four of your lectures, so um, I apologize if some of this information on butterfly is redundant to what you've already heard. Um, but I will give you a little bit of info on the time, place, and people. Uh, and then we'll delve a little bit into some of the libretto, uh, the text that um, the characters are singing out on stage uh, to exemplify American colonialism, expansionism, and exceptionalism as displayed in this piece. So, uh, Madama Butterfly takes place in Nagasaki, Japan, a port town, in 1904. At the time that it was written uh, by Puccini and his team, that was about contemporary time. So, it's supposed to be um, in the conception sort of present day times. Uh, we have a collection of Americans um, who we may examine some of their, some of the words that they speak in the piece, starting with Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton, a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, Sharpless, the U.S. Consul uh, in Nagasaki, Japan, and Kate Pinkerton, who is the spouse of of B.F. Pinkerton. Then we have a few characters who uh, may be uh, othered Americans, identifying as Americans, but not uh, recognized as such. Uh, Butterfly herself and the child of B.F. Pinkerton and Butterfly Sorrow. Sorrow. My apologies if I spoiler spoiled anything for anyone there. Um, I won't get too much into it in case you want the surprise in the performance. So um, I am posing some identifiers for some of these characters. So I want us to think about, as we're listening to the words that B.F. Pinkerton speaks, think about him as uh, a representation of the colonizer or the dominating force and an American. Sharpless, um, we wanna think about him as an intermediary, an American, someone who is providing commentary through the lens of an American exceptionalist. And then Butterfly, um, through the, the lens of one being colonized, uh, the submissive, and one being labeled or perceived as foreign or othered. So just taking some of the lyrics from that first act duet that you heard a tiny snippet of at the beginning of this topic, 
Pinkerton says, everywhere in the world, the Yankee vagabond enjoys himself and trades scorning the risks. He also says he drops the anchor at random until a squall upsets ship and mooring, rigging. Life doesn't satisfy him if he's not making the flowers of every region his treasure. Some expansionist perspective there, kind of moving west and claiming, claiming the treasures as part of, of the colonizer's duties. Pinkerton says his talent works in every place and they toast together America forever. Kind of America is the best. <laughs> now I wanna look a little bit at some comments and perceptions on marriage and divorce. Uh, some of this libretto material is taken from the first act and some from the second act, part one. So Sharpless is toasting Pinkerton um, in advance of his marriage to Butterfly or his ceremony with Butterfly. I drink to your family far away and Pinkerton responds and to the day in which I will marry a, in a real wedding to a true American wife. He explains, thus I'm marrying in the Japanese way for 999 years, free to release myself every month. So it's clear that uh, Pinkerton is not perceiving this uh, as a real, American marriage or butterfly as a true American wife. Uh, Sharpless responds, it would be a great shame that divine mild little voice should not have to sing a song of grief. So he is aware of, I think, this role that butterfly is in as the colonized submissive here. And there's a statement of, of pity there. Um, moving into the second act, um, butterfly has been alone in uh, without Pinkerton for three years. And um, Goro, the marriage broker, has come along with another suitor. And so they're discussing her marriage and the concept of divorce. Goro says, for the wife, abandonment is equivalent to divorce. And she replies, the Japanese law, it is not so for my country. Which country, he says, the United States. Butterfly believes herself to be an American and is interested in marriage and divorce from the American perspective and culture. So she says, it's known that opening the door to drive out the wife in the most abrupt way is what they call divorce here. But in America, this cannot be done. There, a fine judge, serious, dignified, says to the husband, you wish to go away? Let's hear why. I'm bored with married life and the magistrate, ah, scoundrel quickly to prison. In response to this, and also with his awareness of knowing that Pinkerton has sent a letter explaining that he's not coming back, that he's married, um, Sharpless says, I'm saddened by such, com such a complete blindness. So um, I am bringing up these bits of, of the libretti and I invite each of you as you listen to and experience Butterfly to take note of these moments. 
Um, if you don't speak Italian, you might know not know specifically where these translated moments occur, but I know that everyone will recognize that America Forever um, uh, toast in the first act. And uh, you can infer some of what Pinkerton and Sharpless are talking about around that time. It's early in the first act. Um, and yeah, I'd just like you to consider this idea of perceiving specifically what Pinkerton has to say from um, the framing of colonizer, uh, expansionist, American exceptionalist. I want to give you a few takeaways from some Asian identifying academics in the field. First from Yingying Lin, um, who was scholar in residence at San Francisco Opera for their recent production of Madama Butterfly. Uh, she's framing butterfly as a metaphor for expansionism and the West's imperialism over um, Asia. So she is using Pinkerton in this framing as an example of the colonizer and the ex expansionist. Pinkerton displays the most simple of expansions. He buys a 15-year-old girl to be his wife. In today's terminology, that would be sex trafficking. However, in Puccini's day, the fact that Chocho is Japanese, it is considered normal and beautiful that she remains loyal to him for years after he abandons her. He calls her his toy, his butterfly that he can pin to the walls in order to trap her. That is violence, not only against a human being, but essentially against the non-Western world. So this is the idea of butterfly um, through the character and body of Pinkerton, who is representing America, um, demonstrating the Im imperialism of the West over Japan. And then butterfly as a symbol. So um, this is a response from Phil Chan. He's the author of Banishing Orientalism um, and the author of Final Bow for Yellow Face. He also operates that justice group um, and has been working in dance and in, more recently in opera. He directed a recent production of Madama Butterfly uh, at Boston. So he is talking about when he first saw Butterfly. Um, he saw it as just another fantasy that was told in the dramatic way, just like there are stories that take place in Germany and other places. But then he started to dig a little deeper. Um, he says the way we do things in opera and ballet that we've inherited from Europe that don't necessarily serve everyone. These stories have a power and they're telling us specific narratives over and over again at the expense of Asian American voices. What do they reinforce? And what do they tell us? Works like Madama Butterfly, this hypersexual, hypersubmissive Asian woman. You know what happens when we see that on stage? In reality, Asian women are being pushed onto subway tracks and followed home and stalked home and shot down at their places of work, blamed for a disease. How are those two things connected when the arts are a way to empathize with the other? What if our arts aren't doing us that favor anymore because the power depicting them is from 100 plus years ago? If we want this work to still have resonance, we need to help clear away some of the 100 years of cultural baggage so that Puccini's intentions can be kept pure. And I think this may be a good segue into um, Julia's discussion. So I will hand it over to you, Julia. Thanks, Meg. And if you can just change the slide. 
Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, as Meg is addressing um, the contemporary voice of Phil Chan, um, I also just want to address some of the recency of um, this conversation around Orientalism in, in opera. And by the way, the photo in there, that is my dog, Yumi. And I have heard from a few professors that if you have a picture of a cute dog every so often in your slides, people will be like, oh, it's a cute dog, and then they'll pay attention more. I've never actually done the research to know if this is true, but I want to believe it. So I'm gonna keep putting pictures of Yumi in the slides. So um, I wanna highlight a article that came out less than two weeks ago from the New York Times, April 2nd, by the New York Times classical music critic, Zachary Wolf. And the reason I wanna highlight this article is that it clearly holds quite a bit of sway among readers because based on the comments that I read, 131 comments just a few days ago, all of them were in agreement with Wolf, who was essentially arguing that opera companies should not feel bad about performing these operas. And I think that this article highlights um, quite a few of the more standard counter arguments to my own that I actually just want to kind of finish up this presentation by uh, in, in the best way I can actually giving some space for these arguments and then just briefly finishing up with why I, why I disagree. So um, Meg, if you could go to the next slide. Great, thank you. So Zachary Wolf begins with his article by saying, quote unquote, these works turn and Madama Butterfly are tributes to the curiosity about other cultures, the desire to blend your traditions with others and tell stories about more than just yourself that has animated art for as long as humans have been making it. So essentially Wolf is, is making the point that rather than only understanding Turandot and Madama Butterfly as these racist operas, that instead we need to really think about um, their, their capacity for empathy and curiosity that has been an animating force in art forever. Next slide. Great. So to back this claim up, Wolf uh, talks about Puccini's research and he um, you know, fairly extensively writes about how Puccini actually studied Japanese music. And by the way, I, I do put quotes around Japanese music uh, a little sarcastically because I'm, I'm not even really sure what that means. But he, he studied Japanese music. And then um, he, he also, while he was writing Madama Butterfly, he, he had fairly regular discussions with Japanese soprano Tamaki Mura. So just, you know, he's writing this to show Puccini really was trying to do his homework. Um, and the other point he makes is that if we just try to understand Chocho-san and Turandot as just simplistic racist archetypes, that um, we, we do a disservice because from his view, Chocho-san is uh, one of the most complicated characters in Italian opera and Turandot, even though she is the archetype of the dragon lady, that she at least explains her rage, which is a very more empathic thing to do. So next slide. So Wolf argues, quote, as another you know, synthesis, Puccini's universalism was sincerely felt, even if it's unfashionable today. And it deserves to be approached rather appreciated rather than cynically apologized for, as some opera companies seem to do while continuing to reap the ticket selling benefits of his popularity. And I gotta say, I kind of agree with the last part of this statement. And that's not to call our presentation out, but you know, it is to show that for all of these discussions and apologies, opera companies are still performing these operas. So Meg, next slide. So ultimately this article makes, I would say probably three primary counter arguments against folks like me who are saying you should really stop performing these operas. And one is presentism, like the probably the worst insult a historian can receive. And this is that 
calls to stop performing these operas are really just, you know, taking contemporary understandings of race and racism and plastering them onto narratives of the past when they just don't work. Second primary argument is that this is this is a matter of sensitivity that really like we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater over just contemporary feelings. And the third argument is that, um, again, calls like mine to stop performing these operas are, are really simplistic and they're making these um, kind of unhelpful dichotomies between racism here and progressivism here when really the spectrum is a lot more graduated than that. Next slide. So in response to this, I, I think that my letter addresses uh, quite a few of the points that that Zachary Wolf is making, but I would I just want to emphasize that I I truly don't care about Puccini, and what I mean by that is that if I met Puccini on the street, I could probably have a really nice conversation with Puccini. Maybe I would even want to have coffee with Puccini, but that has nothing to do with my problems with his operas. I'm sure that Puccini really did his due diligence and researched Japanese music and had nice dialogues with a Japanese singer. I mean, sure, that's, that's great, but that has nothing to do with Orientalism. Orientalism is about power and it's not even really about feelings. So let's go to the next slide. So if I can just leave a few takeaways from this conversation. It's just really about what Orientalism is, because at least from reading this article that seems to have done pretty well uh, in terms of readership numbers, uh, it, it seems like this journalist doesn't even really know what Orientalism is. So number one, Orientalism, it's, it's not about sensitivity. And it's not to say that um, Asian Americans having their feelings hurt is not important. Trust me, I know. I came away from Turin dot crying. But really, um, if it was just about hurting feelings, I don't know. My mom and I have fairly thick skin. I probably wouldn't be here today. So the second point is that Orientalism is also really not a contemporary issue. So the argument of framing uh, the, the riddle of Turandot as like a contemporary conundrum um, really is just inaccurate. Because again, if my Japanese American ancestors had seen this opera, it would have been just as dehumanizing to them as it, as it is to me. So Orientalism, this is you know, boilerplate Orientalism, is really about creating kinds of narratives that imagine the other as a way of dehumanizing them. And even, even dehumanizing, we could even go and say, you know, what's wrong with dehumanizing? Well, dehumanization, it makes violence, like material violence on mass scales, not just possible, but, but actually palatable. Um, and to be frank, we're seeing this in, in live time um, in, in really big ways right now. Because if we believe that you know, our lives are, are just inherently more valuable than another person's life, then it's a lot easier to get rid of that person. So finally, performing racist operas, it, it exceeds freedom of expression. And this, this argument didn't as explicitly come up in the article, but I do want to just confront it head on um, because you know, freedom of expression is, is something that's, for me, a lot more individual. And again, I just want to bring it back to a, a sincere question I have of like, why, why is it okay for uh, cultural institutions such as San Diego Opera, such as Opera Colorado, to, to perform yellow face in the US? I mean, I can't imagine a, a film <laughs> like with the same tropes being put on in a movie theater today. Like, why is this okay in the opera world? So again, like I'm coming here from love. I love classical music and I'm, I'm genuinely concerned. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much to our amazing panels. That was incredibly, excuse me, <clears throat> incredibly informative and really educational. So, 
we're going to open it up to Q and A. Um, please, Kevin, if you have a question, yes, I'm going to I'm going to get have, to that question in a second. Yes, we have. I'm going to get it in a second. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to get. So, please, if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A, and we will get to it. I just want to get to one very quickly because um, Jennifer Ho has to leave very quickly, and um, although. Julia explained it a little bit more. It'd be wonderful to hear both of you sort of uh, take this on. Um, what is to be gained by continuing to perform Madame Butterfly and Turandot? Um, this question may not be answerable. Why is it that the interests of opera goers who want to enjoy these Orientalist fantasies are more important than the feelings of Asian Americans and others who find these portraits to be irredeemably offensive and trafficking in racist Orientalism? Is it simply that white supremacy and capitalist interests went out against Asian American feelings and racial justice? So maybe Julia, uh, please start us off on that question. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin, and and thank you, Jennifer, for for that great question. Um, you know, I, I, this is also a question I have, so I, I certainly don't have an answer to this, but. Something that Meg and I have been talking about in, in preparation for this talk is just the, it's not even just the fact that opera companies perform these operas, but also how frequently. I mean, as I've learned over the last year, Turandot and Madama Butterfly are, are like the money makers for, for opera companies. And so this isn't an answer, but just maybe to add another question to this question, Jennifer, is that um, what I've learned is that, you know, Madama Butterfly and Turandot seem to be like identity markers within the opera world. Um, there, there seems to be like a, a collective nostalgia around these operas. And I understand that Puccini's music is great. Like again, in the orchestral classical world, we've got our canon too. Um, and I understand how these pieces become so much a part of you that they, they become part of your identity. But it still is really disturbing to me that like these are the operas that um, that there is so much nostalgia built around, and I and I I wish it would stop and change. Yes, and um, yeah, if Meg, you could uh, piggyback on that, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, let's see. Sorry, give me one second. So, Margaret, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, and also. Um, piggybacking on that, um, Heidi Munziger is asking, um, we're talking about sort of race, racial stereotypes, we're talking about sort of um, caricature, um, how is CC, how does CCO plan to deal with the crack character of Billy Jack Rabbit and Walco in their production of Lon Fanchula this summer? Yes, so um, thank you for bringing that up, Heidi. I'll, I'll answer that first. Um, so my start at Central City Opera outside of being a singer was as a cultural consultant to their 2019 production of Madama Butterfly. We will be um, following a similar model with Fanchula del West um, and have an indigenous uh, consultant who will be a resource both to the artistic teams and artists as well as um, providing some uh, public facing programming. Um, and we, were, we will be dedicating our opening night uh, to his work um, that's in development right now. So I'm, it's not entirely clear what, whether that will be an artistic contribution or lecture. Um, so that's that's what we're doing there. Um, those of us who are already at work in the piece, you know, are contending with these challenges. And ultimately, um, you know, I, I'm eager to hear from um, our consultant and members of the indigenous community for their concerns and feedback on the the problematic elements of of this piece. So, um, so 
And then in regards to Jennifer's question, um, I, I, I think I'm coming from a slightly different place than Julia, like having um, been an opera lover for a long time, growing up in a different paradigm and um, having received a lot of work through the portrayal of, of these problematic characters. Um, I like to think that moments like these uh, create space and redemption for what's problematic in these works. Um, so I know that I don't have very much ability to move whether or not the pieces are performed. I have been parts of productions and seen productions that have moved me emotionally and musically and artistically, but I take it as a huge concern that this is, that we're hearing from our own community members that this is not what they want and that this is painful and damaging. Um, so I'm so grateful that we have this time to discuss these difficult things. I see Melanie, uh, Melody's hand raised. Hello all, I will lower my hand. <clears throat> I am so sorry to do this, but I am, it's becoming almost impossible for me to um, navigate uh, what is happening in the Q&A, the chat and my private phone. Um, so I will ask once again for people to um, formulate answerable questions in the Q&A only because if I'm bouncing back and forth, I'm actually not able to, to attend and help listen. Um, one of the private messages, I will take one uh, of the ones that are coming through, um, is posing the question, uh, if, and I'm sorry to uh, bump anybody else's question, but I wanted to at least give somebody one chance that is also um, uh, putting questions forth in another format, although that wasn't uh, the plan. So uh, the question is, uh, if Puccini has made uh, a noble character out of Butterfly and made Pinkerton the evil monster and the America forever becomes um, something that we would boo, you know, because of the way that he has treated this woman. Um, where does that land uh, in this panel today? Where does that land to hear that we, um, and, and in fact, I'll give an example one of our first hosts had given a bit of a graph, right? Stating a uh, character versus caricature, outside fantasy versus inside realism. And Butterfly was kind of put um, somewhere due to the fact that it there was a nobility to the character. Um, how, th please take that as the question and you go with it. Um, I don't know else how to say it. And thank you. Yeah, thanks, Melody. So the question, how, how does it sit with the the idea that um, Cho Cho San is the redeemable character or the good character, uh, the heroine, and Pinkerton is is the guy we boo at the end? Um, I would say to that that it, it really doesn't change a lot for me because I you know I think about the noble savage right where we can romanticize the um, the Indian and and we can boo the, the cowboy, but we're still kind of fantasizing this world um, in, in, in which the power differences are, are so different. So uh, for me, that point is kind of null and void, but um, I don't know, Meg, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think there is a humanity and nobility to the character of Butterfly. I think the revisions that Puccini um, made in uh, adjusting the character and the voice type embodying the character are significant. Um, but ultimately, it's still a tragedy, right? 
she still dies, um, Pinkerton might feel bad about himself. And um, even if we shame him, he still has his life. And I think that's significant in this case. Looks like we Wonderful. have another one. Yeah, Thank you, we, have, uh, we have a couple of more questions. Um, I'm trying to think about it because we have a couple that are kind of combinations. Um, uh, Julia said she'd be happy to answer this. It's more of a question about music, but obviously it's an opera. So it is, there is music in it. Um, and um, I guess this this person's argument falls a little bit more along what um, you alluded to. It. You were talking about the end, which is sort of the counter argument to what you're sort of talking about today. But it is, um, is there no discussion about the music? Um, it's one of the most beautiful operas uh, to have been created. Uh, does that count for nothing? Surely is middle ground between stereotype portrayals and banning entire works. Um, and um, also uh, piggyback onto that, um, Helen Huang, who was one of our earlier uh, panelists week one, uh, talking about it would be interesting to examine what exactly in these operas people are so attached to. Um, is it the music or is it the story or is it the Orientalism? I'm interested to see if pieces of the puzzles are taken out. What would be the reaction of the opera community be? What would the reaction of the Asian community be? Meaning, you know, taking taking the you know taking the staging completely out of it, just performing it as a piece of music. Um, there's probably other ways to present it as well. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And um, yeah, please let's okay, let's begin with Margaret. Is that okay? Yeah, we should begin with Margaret. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, and thanks for the questions. And hi, Helen. <laughs> um, so I I think that the music um, in this piece for me is undeniably beautiful. This presentation was an exercise. And if you were wondering why no discussion of the music, that was quite intentional. Um, I know that there's an upcoming lecture on the music. I'm looking forward to listening to it. But I really wanted to isolate, first of all, the, the topics that we discussed um, are kind of less, in my opinion, less easy to convey through the music. And because the music is so beautiful, I think that it can soften some of the tough things that are communicated through the piece itself and the text. Um, so I think in some ways I agree, like the music is so beautiful um, that I needed to remove it from this discussion so that we could contend with some of what is most difficult and challenging about this work. As far as why people love this piece, is it the music? Is it the story? Is it the staging? Uh, is it the aesthetic? Is it the Orientalism? I, I can't answer that. It's a puzzle to me. Um, I think if you, if, if you want to see the aesthetic, you know, Kevin can speak to this. There are a lot of authentic um, uh, displays of Japanese aesthetics and culture that are equally moving to this piece, um, but maybe we don't have as much access to see them performed in this country. Um, yeah, so I, I'd love to hear Julia's thoughts on what, what people are so um are most compelled by for me it is the music <laughs> yeah so yeah thanks meg and, and thank you uh for this question yeah i mean today we weren't addressing the music and frankly my expertise would not be able to cover that um but i i also just want to address um ewm the person who, who wrote this question also was saying that for me to say that I love classical music is, is kind of a blanket statement because opera is a specific genre. And, and I do, I get that, I, I respect that. I am not like an opera expert by any means, um, but I have played in quite a few pits and I've, I've gone to quite a few operas, um, usually at the Lyric, because that's where I was for a number of years. But um, 
I would say in terms of just balancing again, I, I've heard this question come up a few times of just the the beauty, the beauty of the opera. How do we contend with the beauty of the opera? And um, I, I would I agree. Listening to both operas, I, I find the music to be stunning. Um, and we're also in an era in which we're really starting to seriously think about, um, you know, what does it mean to decolonize a canon? Like what even is a canon and what makes up a canon? And I tread carefully here because there, there's, a, there's a spectrum here, right? Like I, I wouldn't say I'm in the boat of just throwing out all meters of, of what is um, better or, or worse. But I also would say that a lot of these things do come down to subjective opinions and and power of of who is deciding which which pieces of art end up in a museum. So to get back though to you know how do we contend with the beauty of this music, I would say that something that's really fundamental for me with these performances is the fact that these operas are live. Um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful music in which the the bands are gone. Like we listen to them on albums. I, I love the Beatles and none of us here can listen to the Beatles live anymore. We listen to albums and that's okay. And there's something different about opera companies putting so much energy, care, thought, money, um, time into to putting these operas on in the present so often. Wonderful. Yeah, no, it's uh, these, um, yeah, so we have, we uh, uh, just in terms of my my expertise in, in Japanese dance, yes, it's, um, it's, it, it actually comes, it actually comes to a question I'd like to ask. We have a couple of questions, but they're kind of in the same sort of realm as what we've already sort of asked. And, and we did sort of address one question is kind of about the fantasy element. It's a, you know, and many of these operas are very bombastic and have big emotions and band that they're sort of fantastical that what, what is the problem? But I think we've already kind of addressed that. Um, my, and my question is because of my perspective as somebody who does traditional Japanese things, and Margaret might be able to sort of understand this, maybe more than others. Um, and we've talked about co colonization, we talked about colonialism. Is opera part of that process of colonialism? The genre itself, as a, as a, as a, we've, I mean, we've talked about Turandot, we've talked about Fondula, we've talked about Butterfly, we've talked about problematic characters in three different operas. Um, opera is a genre of music from Europe, primarily created by white people from Europe, is opera itself a part of colonialism? Um, whoever wants to take that. It's a simple question maybe, but it very, requires a very complex answer. And I, I hate to do this at the end of today's um, <laughs> of panel discussion, but I kind of look, like to maybe hear your thoughts on that. Do you hate to, do you hate to put it at the end, Kevin? <laughs> Yeah, Kevin, I, I love this question so much. I probably won't delve into the difficulties of the answer a whole lot at this at this moment, but I think the short answer is yes, I do believe that. Um, so my um, doctoral research area was um, was on a topic similar to this. So, you know, when Japan was open to the West, uh, there was a whole cultural exchange process that started. Uh, and some of my favorite Japanese music is from this time period. Uh, composers like Koshak Yamada, who went and studied uh, with Dvorak, um, some really beautiful music to sing. Uh, and then uh, but I do think there was a period of validation where the authentic traditional musical styles had to be put away in order to, um, and the reason why I don't want to get into this too much is because, you know, uh, Japan had its own period of imperialism and colonization of other Asian spaces. Um, and I think 
but I do think there's a musical reflection here, right? That um, at some period we, in some ways, had to put away the traditional um, and ancient musical styles and adopt Western musical styles uh, as part of the process of being colonized by the West. Uh, I Then that comes full, full so, circle later. Um, one of the artists who I spent a lot of time uh, studying and researching was a Japanese opera composer named Minoru Miki. And he was all about this idea of konketsu, which means cultural mixture and finding a way where the two worlds of East and West, traditional Japanese practice and Western um, operatic storytelling can ex coexist in a new art form. So I think, yes, it, it yes, that happened. And I think that we're contending with ways of redefining our art form. Um, and it's a very exciting time in opera because of that. May I thank you both as we begin to, we've got about 15 minutes left and I want as long as we possibly can to continue with questions. Um, this has been the most activity that I have seen from audiences and the most involvement. And that is exactly what we had hoped for um, is rich, open discussion, uh, censoring no one and allowing deep conversations to happen. And ones that um, reveal fragility. That's, that is a hope of mine and mine shows all the time. The, the ability for the, the rising temperature of me to be able to sit and go, I am part of the problem, or I have been part of a problem in my life, not as an administrator, even just in my life. Um, so I just, this intelligent conversation has happened and all of the questions that people have been brave enough to ask, I have asked that they state um, in the chat what it is they love about Butterfly because the question was posed. I stated what I loved about it. Um, anyone else, please feel free to do so. Um, anybody else have, let's see, I think we have a question pertaining to, oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Kevin, yeah, I think oh. about the opera realism. Just no, none of it's realistic or believable. <laughs> oh, who's dying today, you know? Um, and we have another, I, it might be a, not a question. It's more, but a, it's more, of, a, it's more of a comment. Yeah, comment? it's just saying the history of opera in America absolutely is tied to colonialism, expansion, and manifest destiny. And settlers moved west across the country. And one of the first things they did was show the community they had made it was to build an opera house and bring in European operas and singers. Yes. So <laughs> yeah. that is that right. is that is almost a perfect example of kind of what I was asking you, which is kind of incredible. Um, but, uh, yeah, we I don't. Go ahead, go ahead. So, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of is opera part of colonialism? Yeah, it, it sounds like it based on what Heidi's <laughs> saying. Because, but in some ways, I mean, we could say very similar things about uh, broadly classical music and and also the university, which is, you know, where I work. And I think like, yes, but it, that's not a reason to just toss out opera or toss out classical music or toss out the university. It's, it's how we, it's how we move these institutions forward. And so I hope like the, the last thing I, I want people to take away from this is, you know, Julia railing against all of opera and wanting to take down opera like that, that no. <laughs> um, yeah, opera is colonial, and and also like how do we how do we support opera composers today to to really transform how we understand opera in the future and for future generations? Like that that's what we should be about, right? We're having similar conversations in the academy of like yeah, the the academy is deeply deeply colonial. How do we transform what also can be a really powerful space? I feel like when our thoughts get expanded, we have the potential to drop one droplet of water in the opposite direction that a stream has gone. 
And even in listening, we are opened to a degree to another perspective. And I believe it changes how we treat each other and how we treat the world around us. So um, rich discourse is, is not a reason to run and hide under the bed, right? Um, and I'm glad for those who haven't. And I believe we have a very brave audience here and um, hosts who are willing to sit in some, in some fever, <laughs> you know? about what does it mean to know better? It means to do better, um, hopefully. Heidi, thank you for this. Um, Heidi is one of our, Heidi has, has really been instrumental in helping me to get this together. Um, wouldn't have happened without Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Anybody yeah, I, I, else? Oh, I think there's a chat. It was a really good one today. Anybody, let's see, is there another question? No. Comments, concerns, burning desires. I want to hug you both, Meg. Thank you. And thank you, Julia, for um, holding um, mirrors up and um, allowing us to kind of see facets of what happens. Um, just in opera, I was thinking about slippery slopes the other day because I thought, you know, white guy writes about um, West Side Story. Um, how much of that is is lived experience? How much of that was a good musical idea? And then we can just keep trickling and trickling. And I, under, I understand why people ask, you know, is any opera realistic? But um, it to know better is to think in a deeper way. So thank you for allowing us to listen and and ask and thank everybody. If there are no more burning desires, Helen, thank you. Thank you everybody in the chats. And I'm sorry that I couldn't keep up. I just am bouncing all over the place and getting texts. So <laughs> something was said that made us think and I'm so appreciative. Kevin, thank you so much. We're gonna um, next, next time, uh, we are focusing on exactly what a lot of people had wanted to know more about is the music, some of the themes that were uh, used, why they were used, uh, where they were um, found. Um, and uh, Dr. Teksu Kim, who will be with us next week, will also be our pre-show lecturer for the entire series uh, for, for the operas. So he is a musicologist and uh, composer. He will, he will be fascinating. He's a wonderful man. And so kind to us to be here, as are all of you. Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you next week for our last one. Thank you. Thank you.